Thank you, Ellen. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I just want to say that, first of all, I think we all have to recognize that this is an amazing moment in history. We have the first treaty that focuses on limitations and exceptions for the users instead of focusing on the right holder. So this really is an amazing, an amazing um, moment in time. This is a human rights treaty concluded by WIPO, and so we're talking about the intersection of human rights and intellectual property here. I think that the treaty is, is a good one. Um, it provides a clear pathway forward, unlike some other limitations and exceptions provided in other treaties, for example, the Byrne Appendix. I think this treaty is very clear. Uh, it has a number of very positive provisions in it, for example, allowing direct distribution to beneficiaries. I think the provision on TPMs, uh, the way that it was crafted, was done in a way that um, is also very positive. It ensures that uh, that TPMs do not override the rights that were created in this treaty for beneficiary persons. Um, the definition of authorized entities is, is broadly framed. Um, it is amazing to me that fair use practice and dealing is specifically mentioned in this treaty. I think it's the first time it's specifically been mentioned in an international treaty. And fair use, practice, or dealing is commonly found in common law, but also in some civil law countries as well. And I think the reason why it's so important to have this in here is because it creates a lot of flexibility to implement this, this treaty and to uh, ensure that there's flexibility going forward so that you're not stuck in a particular time, you're not stuck with a particular um, law that you might have created in, in implementing this treaty. I think that uh, just speaking of flexibilities, that this treaty also has a lot of respect for national law and the legal systems and practices of each domestic context. So it preserves flexibilities and preserves the rights of member states to, um, to implement this treaty in taking into consideration uh, the domestic context. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, there are, well, well, I think it's a very, very good tr treaty. Um, of course, KEI was negotiating the treaty with itself. We're negotiating with the World Blind Union. There are certain things that we would have changed or not included in the treaty. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think that those, um, those issues that I see are, are a complete hindrance to obtaining the objectives of the treaty. For example, while the three-step test is, is mentioned in uh, with respect to export, I think it's Article 5, um, and it basically says that you have to either be a member of the WCT or implement the three-step test. First of all, it's, it's very narrow, doesn't cover the entire treaty, and is limited to export, but also to remember that the members of this treaty are not bound by a particular inter interpretation of the three-step test. So, you know, something that I, I think that member states can do is to implement it in a way that that is more flexible and more open. Um, for example, by implementing it in by referencing, for example, the Max Planck Declaration, which takes a more holistic approach to the three-step test. It uh, kind of is more of a balancing test. If you fail one step, you don't necessarily fail the three-step test. Um, there was also mention of commercial availability in Article Four on uh, the making of an accessible form of work, but that provision is not mandatory. Countries do not have to implement commercial availability. And even when they do, it requires notification to the Director General. So I think that raises the visibility of countries that do that um, and allows civil society to place pressure on governments not to implement a commercial availability requirement. So um, I, think, I think my time is up. Well, um, you know, my own interpretation of what I've seen of the text, and I haven't, even though I did look at the draft text that came out of the 25th, you know, the final text you didn't see until very recently, and I haven't had a lot of time to really go through it and really take a lot of time to analyze it. But the way that I read the many references to the three-step test is Jonathan counted them. I think he said there's 10 direct or indirect references to the three-step test. Um, you know, one of Article 11 on general obligations on exceptions and limitations recites it three times. 
But it prefaces it oh, with four, a... Four times. Four times, yes, four times, sorry. They, they mentioned the three-step test in the WCT twice. Um, the, there's a chapeau at the beginning of that that says, uh, in adopting measures necessary to ensure the application of this treaty, a contracting party may exercise the rights and shall comply with the obligations that that contracting party has under the Berne Convention, TRIPS Agreement, and the WCT, including their interpretive agreements. So first of all, I, my reading is that because it says that that contracting party has, those are only the obligations that the party already has um, with respect to either being a member of the Berne Convention, the TRIPS Agreement, or the WCT. If they are not members, they don't carry those obligations. Secondly, it also said, specifically notes that it includes their interpretive agreements. The way I read that is that it includes the agreed upon statements in, um, in those agreements. So that would include the footnote to Article 10 of the WCT, and Article 10 is what contains the three-step test and says that you know they can carry forward limitations and exceptions in the digital environment. Um, as, as I mentioned briefly when I was given the opportunity to speak earlier, there is a specific mention of the three-step test with regard to um, with regard to export, and that uh, that reference says that. The, unless the contracting party is a member of the WCT with regard to distribution and making available, then the three-step test applies. But as I mentioned um, in, in my earlier statement, that uh, there's nothing in this agreement that provides for an interpretation of the three-step test. Even though the WTO has interpreted the three-step test once, um, it's only done so once, that um, that ruling is not binding on future WTO panels. It is not the uh, interpretation that is binding on the Berne Convention, the WCT, or on this treaty. So that's, that's my reading.